And we keep things rolling here on the Sports Cubicle. I'm your host, Mike Mercado, and there's no more snow. I've put away the snow boots. The shovel is in the garage. That means spring has finally shown to Chicago. I actually think the river is green, and not just because we had a long weekend. That means baseball is here, and on this side of the Sports Cubicle, we get to talk about the north side of Chicago, and we have somebody who's a friend of the show who's finally making his debut. He works for the mothership at the Heartland Signal. He is also one of the lead writers over at Cubby's Crypt. He is our friend. He is Rich Aberwine. Rich, welcome to the show, my friend. <laughs> Mike, thanks for having me. I feel like it's been a long time coming. We do this every single day off the air. It's it's about time we record it. So. Absolutely. And and you do great work. You know, it's not just one of these things where, oh, we're bringing on a buddy and he's, you know, he just knows baseball. You actually put in a lot of work, not just on the baseball side of it when it comes to your writing skill. You write about pop culture. You write about stuff that's going on in the community that's important to day-to-day real life stuff and I think it's great to see that type of talent come into baseball so before we get into actual baseball talk what was it about the Cubs Major League Baseball that really made you want to go down that avenue while you're also doing other stuff in your career oh my gosh well you know the the playoff runs in the mid 210s <laughs> sure, you know yeah, the, yeah. the World Series yeah. run I was like I you know in the middle of that season I, I've been a lifelong Cubs fan right like my my team when I was a kid was 2008 Cubs you know, Giovanni Soto, Aramis Ramirez, Derek Lee, those types, that team. Um, and then I had like a long lull where I was like not like floating in and out of baseball. I would keep track of it a little bit. But then like 15, 16 was when I was like, you know, I, th- I thought I was out. They brought me back in. <laughs> like I was fully back in those years. And I have just been like following baseball to a T since then, like just the entire league. But yeah, Cubs. Yeah, you know, during that 16 season, you could tell something special was happening. Like, just if you just go look at their stat lines, you're like, "Wow, that that doesn't happen all, often." Where so, the stars align like that. So, like in that specific situation where you are able to get inspired by what your fandom is and then over these years you've been able to use your actual craft and the skill that you've obtained over these from your university days to now your career days how impactful or how much of a benefit do you think it is in the way you cover not just pop culture not just anything in the political realm but the chicago cubs having that type of skill tree using a video game term to <laughs> have at your disposal because you have a critical eye when it comes to detail to doing your research how important has that been for you not just as a journalist especially covering the cubs and baseball but you know as a fan to also understand both sides of the aisle yeah immensely it's immensely important um i covered baseball in college too so like i got i got a good sense of how to cover the game like boots on the ground and also how to just write and research in general i was a history minor journalism major so i i was constantly writing and researching throughout my college career and just kept doing it after college and you know, I got this job here at Heartland Signal, but I wanted to, you know, keep that muscle going with the with the, in the baseball realm. So I just picked up Cubby's crib, you know, writing for them on a freelance basis, and it just flexes that baseball muscle constantly. And I get to follow and write about my favorite team at the same time, and it's a lot of fun. So you ready to work out that muscle today? You Hell ready yeah. to do this? All right, Heck let's yeah. do it. So, all right, let's let's uh, let's do this one. I've talked about Craig Council being the new Chicago Cubs. You're one of the first people I called when the breaking <laughs> news hit that that very early, yeah. late, uh, early afternoon day. I, I, from what I recall, we just were screaming at each yeah. other over the phone. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> it was oh an English God. language. Yeah, there was no actual words. There <laughs> were more actual real words in the Dune movie than there yeah. were in that It was very chaotic. Man. <laughs> yes, very much so. But let's talk about the impact because we've talked about the biggest thing that I see in the entire scope of it is bringing in a manager that depletes a team that's in your own division on top of a manager that's going to have a lot of knowledge in the division and has been in so many different scenarios and still kind of clicks with the young player from his knowledge of actually playing on the game. Craig Council's impact on the Chicago Cubs, good, bad, indifferent, all the different aspects that we could take a look at. What does it mean for the Cubs to have a new man in charge in that dugout post David Ross, post Joe Madden, now that you're at the Craig Council era, is it going to be a scenario where it's the guy after the guy is what's going to maybe take him over the top? Where are you with this big hire of the new manager? I think it's it's invaluable for a lot of different reasons, and the Cubs know that too because they they obviously see him, at, they value him very highly because they gave him the largest managerial contract in baseball history. He is generally regarded as one of the best managers in baseball. 
for a lot of reasons, the chief majority of them being like his baseball, his uh, lineup and bullpen construction. He consistently over the course of almost 10 years in Milwaukee got results out of an inferior roster where you look at their bullpen and you see a bunch of guys that you don't recognize their names but then you look at their stats and you're like oh my god this guy's got a sub three ERA like half their bullpens like blow three ERAs and you're like man I think that's where his strength is where it's like he knows his his players and he knows how to use them in certain situations where it's like that was one of the Cubs main weaknesses last year with David Ross his inexperience proved to be one of the things that didn't get them over that hump and get them into the playoffs you know how many times were we bashing our heads against the walls where we're like how long how many chances is he going to give Eric Hosmer how many chances is he going to give Trey Mancini where it's like to the point where the GM Jed Hoyer had to like baby proof the roster and dfa those guys and eat salary he had to eat money on trey mancini and tucker barnhart's deals just to get them out of the raw out of the building so ross would stop putting them in the lineup you know it's just stuff like that that i think is going to be incredibly mitigated under craig council where it's like you know we're already seeing it with christopher morrell La- a year ago i was saying Put him at third base. He's not, you know, obviously he's a defensive liability there now, but you're already seeing he's not going to get better unless you play him there. And Craig Council knows that, and he's at least giving him a look there. You know, he left the door open where he's like, I'm not naming him my starting third baseman, but I'm going to give him reps there because he's not going to get better if you just put him in the DH role like Ross did. So I already am seeing signs where I'm like, yes, Craig Council is doing the right things and making decisions that I think is going to bring this team over the edge this year. How much of the hire of Craig Council impacted how Jed Hoyer and Carter Hawkins were going to be when it came to spending money? We're going to get into Cody Bellinger in just a second, but Craig Council almost feels like he is the answer to the variables, that he's the answer to the margins that David Ross might have been blamed for. Mm -hmm. Whether rightfully or not, whatever the opinion may be, I think the idea of you bring in that manager, like you said, to have that big contract because he is the X factor in a lot of those decisions. Mm -hmm. How much of the Cubs' success this coming up season, specifically this 2024 season, falls on the shoulders, on the hands of Craig Council? I think a lot of it because David Ross was the pretty much the chief reason they didn't make the playoffs last year and I think if they did you Craig Council wouldn't be here you know if say Suzuki didn't drop that ball in Arizona and the Cubs somehow made it into the playoff picture David Ross would probably still be the manager and the Cubs would not be better off for it I don't think so there is a lot of pressure on Craig Council as your your free agent question though I don't think bringing in Craig Council had a ton to do with the free agent decisions that they made because they made all the moves that they needed to and did it properly I think you know Marcus Stroman opted out of his deal they went out and got Shota Imanaga replaced Stroman in the rotation they went out and got a couple bullpen arms with uh, Yancy Almonte I think is his name from uh, he was in the Michael Bush trade um, and Hector Neris, who is going to be a setup man slash closer, I think, and Michael Bush. They got a first baseman, who I think is going to be uh, one of the major, you say an X factor. I think he could be finally f- not only fill that hole at first base that's been there since Anthony Rizzo left or was traded, um, but he could be a legitimate power threat from the left side, 25-plus home runs, I think. Uh, and he's young. He could be here for a long time. So I think they just made all the moves that they needed to do, and not to mention Cody Bellinger. You know, like they, that was an obvious one. That's a no brainer. Why don't we get into Cody Bellinger? But before we get to Cody Bellinger coming back to the Chicago Cubs and what they are going to be looking to do, perhaps with a huge injury that is looming for the Chicago Cubs, we want to make sure that everybody goes support our guest who's in studio. He is Rich Eberwine. And of course, you can check out all his work at Cubby's Crib. He is from the mothership. Heartland Signo, and he is doing some amazing work about baseball, pop culture, and everything in between. So make sure you guys check out his work. Support our guy. We'll leave a link down below if you're listening to us on YouTube and, of course, wherever you get your favorite podcast at the Sports Cubicle and Sports from the Couch. I'm your host, Mike Mercado, and it's been a busy show. The Cubs were also really busy up and past the beginning of spring training when they brought back Cody Bellinger. And I want to run through some multiverse stuff with you, Rich, okay? When it comes to Belly. Sure. What would things have been with Bellinger 
now on the team, how does the outlook look for the 2024 Chicago Cubs with Bellinger playing center field, playing first base? What would it have been like if Cody Bellinger didn't sign with the Chicago Cubs in 2024? What would the outlook be for the Northsiders? Why don't we start with what actually did happen and Cody Bellinger signing with the Cubs and what it means for this team, what it means for the development of Christopher Morrell, PCA, all the different scenarios that occur with him now joining the Chicago Cubs on the type of deal he did. What were your thoughts on the news that Cody Bellinger, a Scott Boris Mm -hmm. led Cody Bellinger, now signed with the Chicago Cubs, the impact it has that he did sign with them? Well, you know, my reaction was duh like <laughs> this this was an, a no-brainer move from both sides right like Cody Bellinger coming off of three straight years where he was trash with the Dodgers you know part of that was due to injury part of it was the pandemic but in 2022 he was just bad he had a 650 OPS so last year he flipped the script with the Cubs and got back to his like MVP caliber form he batted 300 he cranked 26 home runs 97 RBIs and that's missing a month of the season if he had played 150 plus games he would be in the MVP conversation last year so it just made all the sense in the world for him to come back here Um, the fans love him he resurrected his career here and he was the rock of their lineup when that month of the season that he missed the Cubs fell to their lowest point last year which was 10 games below 500 you know maybe he wasn't the only factor in that but he was certainly a big one uh so he's the rock of their lineup he's their cleanup hitter and their best power hitter their best left-handed hitter and he plays gold glove defense wherever you know he, he can play center left right and first base at gold glove caliber level so he is immensely valuable and the type of deal that he signed I don't hate because I think the Cubs were trying to avoid getting themselves in a situation where it was similar to the Jason Hayward type of thing Jason Hayward similarly came off like a career year with the Cardinals that year and they gave him an eight-year largest contract in team history and it bit them in the ass, you know, like it did not work out well in the long run. Right. It's from a production standpoint, it gave them a World Series. But, you know, after that, it wasn't great. Um, so I think the Cubs were trying to avoid that. But uh, and Bellinger obviously wanted a long term deal. But I think he was fine signing this basically another prove it contract because the Cubs gave also gave him 30 million dollars a year. So even if he stinks, he's going to make 30 mil a year. Um, if he doesn't, he can opt out and get paid. So The thing about the Bellinger deal, and, and I thought this as soon as it happened, and you and I, I think, talked about it off mic, that the conversation was the Cubs got one over on Cody Bellinger and not the Cubs got one over on Scott Boris. Mm. Because I think, like you said, it's a good deal for Cody Bellinger. He's getting paid a lot of guaranteed money. He has a chance to still opt out. If not, he has a chance to still have a team next year. He has a chance to prove it and get paid big money mm-hmm. in a big market with a team that's going to be playing meaningful games if they play up to par. So I think it worked out for everybody and i'm not gonna cry boohoo for scott boris who also went out with a lot of money so it was a win-win-win for a lot of people it wouldn't have been a win-win-win if cody bellinger didn't sign with the chicago cubs along with not signing shohei otani along would, with missing marcus stroman and I, so on and I so forth i would feel a lot worse about this year i would be a lot more bearish on the season instead of bullish like i am right now if bellinger was not back and we're talking how much because i think it is going to be something that we can't even really understand because it, it didn't up happening but it would have been huge had he signed with anybody else as bad as the NL Central may look at points if depending on your perspective of the division or what other teams may have not having him makes you a bottom dweller in that division purely off having to rely on Michael Bush having to rely on Christopher Morrell not only developing on defense but continuing to develop on defense and having the energy to be a spark plug on offense you're relying on Ian Happ doing things that Ian Happ can't do as an offensive player to be able to lead a team like there's a lot of stuff that happened you know who knows Seiya Suzuki's career trajectory if he doesn't have Cody Bellinger in the lineup like there is a lot that would have been big holes would not would have been like Thanos and doing the, the 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 snap like it would have been dusted any type of of hope of development and competing goes away without Cody Bellinger yeah I mean in the lineup he takes pressure off pretty much everybody right like he, he protects everybody in the lineup mm. and mm. uh on defense like you know if he wasn't signing with the team it probably would have been like Pete Crow Armstrong is your everyday center fielder which is you know not the worst thing in the world because defensively he's 
arguably even better than Cody Bellinger, but his bat needs time to develop. And I think, you know, even if Cody Bellinger opts out after this year, you have another year of development mm-hmm. for PCA under your mm-hmm. belt, which is huge. It could be huge. So there is one thing that I am very worried about when it comes to the Chicago Cubs, even though they did make a big splash adding into the rotation, even in the bullpen. I don't like that. We are hearing news that Jamison Tyone is probably going to the IL with a back injury. Mm-hmm. And I don't like that it is probably their biggest weakness is a lot of talent, but I still need to see it. I'm on the field is this pitching rotation. I think Justin Steele is the truth, but just like anybody, when we crown somebody, when we think they're going to take that next step, we still need to see it a year after year after year, whenever he gets a chance. I think he's going to be nasty this coming up season if he stays healthy, but they are very much top heavy in a rotation. And I bring this up because a report came out, or at least a rumor has come out. So we know the Cubs went out and got a Scott Boris guy in Cody Bellinger. And if you're going to have an injury in Jamison Tyone, if you think you're going to compete, if you're going to go for it, if you think you're going to get a deal, Jordan Montgomery, What do you think about the Cubs maybe adding one more piece before the end of March, bringing in, and it's not going to be a bat. It's not going to be a superstar. It's a reliable pitching arm. I don't like it. I don't like them signing another mega deal because the type of deal that guys like Jordan Montgomery and Blake Snell are commanding or wanting right now or it's five to seven year type Mm -hmm. of things, I don't see Jed Hoyer doing it, A, and I don't want him to be. And here's why. Because they have a lot of pitching depth. They have a lot of starting pitching depth. And even though Caleb Killian went down, you still have Hayden Wesneski, Jordan Wicks, Ben Brown to lean on. And later in the season, you'll have Kate Horton. I mean, I don't want them to spend a ton of money right now on starting pitching one reason also is because at the end of this year you could have justin Steele, cade horton um jamison tyone uh jordan wicks and then who is the best free agent starting pitcher next year is corbin burns who spent the last seven years under craig council and i think the cubs have a better chance of signing him than almost any other team in the league if the Baltimore Orioles don't lock him up to a uh, long-term deal. So I think it's smarter to lean on your depth this year, let them develop and get them looks in the big leagues like Jordan Wicks, a full season under his belt. Hayden Wesneski could have a bounce back year. Cade Horton, get him up in the MLB and get him experience up here and then go out and sign another ace in Corbin Burns next year because you have like – $40 $40 million coming off the books this year between Kyle Hendricks, Drew Smiley, Trey Mancini's deal, and Tucker Barnard's deal are still on the books. That's crazy. They're still giving That's Jason so Hayward $5 million this year. That's unbelievable. Shout out to Jason Hayward, <laughs> man. Get that money, boy. He got the bag. My boy. You have a lot of money coming off the books, and I think you should go invest it in another ace where the one-two punch of Corbin Burns and Justin Steele could be deadly. And if Cade Horton turns out to be a dude as your number three, and e- followed by Imanaga and Jordan Wicks, like you, that is a postseason rotation right there. That's my dream scenario right now. But in the short term, I think lean on your depth. Don't go all in on a pitcher like Jordan Montgomery because he's not the type of pitcher you want either. He's uh, he, they, the the Cubs need a right-handed pitcher power pitcher with a lot of strikeouts they need a ace jordan montgomery is like a good three Mm. you know Mm. he's not he's had one great year and it was last year but like he's had other good years but one great year you know i want i want a corbin burns in my starting rotation right now who is going to be a cy young contender for years let's do it rich tell me your predictions we're gonna put you in the spot i know there's still a lot of stuff that can happen there's still a lot of spring training but as of the middle of march before teams go to korea before we start (laughs) baseball what do you think the cubs 2024 is going to look like do they win the nl central are they a wild card team are they a team that's going to start off slow how is the season going to play out for the 2024 chicago cubs i foresee them making the postseason and contending for the division uh I think there's a really good chance they win the division. Uh, 87, 85 to 90 wins is not out of the question for this team, I don't think. With the addition of Craig Council, with bringing Cody Bellinger back, supplementing your bullpen, and not to mention the young talent that's coming up that could help your bullpen. You have a lot of, lot of pitching depth. The Cubs, I think their main strength right now is their ability to develop pitchers, which is... 
as a fairly new thing for them. Like the, you're starting to see the fruits of that come on the major league roster this year, and it's going to just keep happening with like guys like Luke Little and Daniel Palencia. So I think that those little things, those little areas, are going to elevate them. And on paper, I think they're the best team in the NL Central. So I see them making the postseason, 85 to 90 wins. Caden Horton comes up and makes a significant impact on the rotation. You were really early on Justin Steele last season. I remember you and I talking about it February, March. You were really high in on Justin Steele really early. So it might be something to that for all you people with the uh, FanDuel DraftKings, which shout out to them if you guys ever want to sponsor the Sports Cubicle. Let us know. <laughs> this is awesome, Rich. Thank you so much. You can check out all his amazing work over at Cubby's Crib. And he does some awesome work around there. You guys can check out all the links. We'll make sure we leave them down below wherever you get your favorite podcast and YouTube video. Rich, any final thoughts as we, uh, as we get ready for baseball? Two weeks, we'll be watching Justin and steal mow down the Texas Rangers in Arlington. So go Cubs, go baby. Shout out to Major League Baseball also for giving us Cubs baseball in Texas where for sure we'll be able to watch them on Easter Sunday. So shout out to the Chicago Cubs. Rich, thank you so much, brother. Is there anywhere people can support you? Anything you want to promote? Anything for the people here in Chicago? So Cubby's Crib, uh, and I repost all my articles that I write on Cubby's Crib on my Twitter account. So that's at Rich underscore Ebbs. So go give me a follow there and look out for my articles and yeah thanks for supporting we got more coming up next here on the sports cubicle i'm mike mercado